Bonsoir. Good evening, everybody. Bonsoir à tous. Merci Thank you very much for the second uh, crash conference uh, of the year. And last, one one. I'm really delighted to welcome this evening Lise Barnayou, here on my left, who is a scientific journalist and who has written and published a book that came out this summer. It's called Immunisé, a new regard on, a new look at the uh, vaccines. And this is her book in front of you. And when I read it, and when and some of us here at MSF have read it, we found that the, the book, and Lise will talk more about it, but it's, it, it enters into the public debate about vaccination. And it's a, a very informative and clear and educational but uh, it is also, it's also a means to re-engage in a conversation on the practice of the vaccination uh, policies of MSF. Uh, so Lise's book uh, enters, uh, comes into the debate at a moment when the, we are looking at all the permutations, which is taking a special turning point with a certain disaffection toward vaccination by even French people and because we, they felt that there was a certain authority by the public authorities concerning the, the duty to be vaccinated. But this book also uh, uh, helps contribute to the controversy and also the roles of laboratories in, in uh, vac uh, vaccine production. And so this is a way to look and to wonder about how MSF and how MSF will position itself in this discussion uh, in, uh, in the midst of this uh, operation. So we found it interesting to do uh, this exercise, to try to uh, open up an echo chamber, as it were, through Lee's. Uh, about our uh, inoculations and our policies in terms of vaccination. To discuss about all this, we felt it would be interesting to invite uh, around the table not only Lise, but also somebody who is directly uh, a direct participant in this, uh, this uh, policy, this, this vaccine policy uh, at Epicentre. And also the, the brainstorming does on this issue about the measures that we do to be able to interact and to uh, ask questions and to ask Lee's for her conclusions on this. So we're very uh, happy to have uh, further down the table uh, Emmanuel Baron, who is the director of uh, Epicentre, and uh, he will contribute to it. So this uh, th we will this will be a three-phase discussion. We'll have a discussion with Lee's and as she will present her book, during which the discussion, Emmanuel will react to it on certain of the points to see how and why this book may inspire a certain number of, uh, 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 a certain amount of brainstorming uh, on her experience. And traditionally, we'll then open up the floor to your questions or your comments. And so I'm also very happy to be able to welcome this evening. It's just a coincidence, which I've just learned. Both, it wasn't done on purpose, but the participants in the in in a training session here, and a certain number of participants of uh, of the training course on response to epidemics, and in fact, they are studying vaccination at the moment. So this is the perfect occasion for them to be able to have them here and perhaps to participate with us. Perhaps we can add something just to say that uh, Epicentre and it crashed. We also are trying to do the work and we're trying to start up uh, uh, brainstorming in common between crash and Epicentre. And so this conference is a part of the framework of that. And we also to be presented by MSF and come back to MSF with questions we we're trying to work on and discuss uh, at Epicentre. And so one final thing before we open up that we give the floor to Lise, which we are hoping to end around 8 o'clock this evening. We are going to have a chance to be able to talk with Emmanuel and Lise 
uh, around around a glass uh, afterwards. And so uh, please stay with us right at the end. And those who will be interested, the publisher of this uh, book is uh, Edition Parallel. And she has a few copies here that she's brought with this. She is pre present here, and she has brought some copies with her if you're interested in, in purchasing it. And so thank you very much, Lise, for having come, uh, and Lise in particular. And so I'm going to start up the discussion by asking Lise a question. What has motivated her to uh, write this book? and the way that she went about it, and uh, how did you investigate the, for the information in it uh, to carry out the scientific uh, investigation, social and, uh, and economic uh, aspects of vaccination. So thank you very much uh, for your invitation. And I'm delighted to talk about my book, but I'm, I'm, I'm above all delighted to hear about what you have to say. Uh, I stress once again that this book, uh, in the context, but it raises uh, certain questions uh, if, uh, for vaccines in general. And I was very interested in the topic, first of all, as a journalist. And so I'm very interested in hearing your questions concerning it. Uh, and I'd like to see how this, I'm very curious to learn how this book may have an influence or may help you uh, with your work at MSF. So about the book, I am a scientific journalist. And I process a lot of questions on, on health, and I have done, done so for several years, in particular uh, on vaccination. Uh, and uh, generally, I'm very satisfied with the way that the topic has been dealt with uh, up until now. But I realized that to be able to talk about vaccines in as rigorously as possible that I wanted to do, I knew that I really had to get my roll up my sleeves and get into it and to study in greater detail the, uh, each vaccine. And so I had the occasion, the opportunity, uh, about two years ago, because I coordinated uh, a, a one-off mon uh, monograph uh, on this issue two years ago. And so I am an independent journalist. And so one of my employers at the time asked me to do this monograph on vaccines. And so that's when I got into studying vaccines. And this, uh, this work uh, helped me get much more interested, not just an, in vaccination as we have we, from a journalistic point of view, but, but also vaccine by vaccine. And that's when I realized that up until present, there we had a look which was much too simplistic on this issue of vaccination and vaccines. And so, uh, you know that there's going to be an evolution in, in, the, in the medical laws in the country. And so I felt that this was the time to be able to uh, weigh into the discussion with my book. And in parallel, I also had this uh, desire to do this book uh, based on my own experience as a mother and living in a a, 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 re, a, a village in the Drôme, in the, uh, the, in the center of France. And because some, many of the people in the area are, are against vaccinations. And so I often found myself in discussions which seemed to me were of a style the, the, where I heard arguments or counter arguments uh, for vaccines. On the other hand, when I myself uh, consulted uh, specialists and doctors to be able to gather information, uh, I found myself faced with arguments which I found sometimes which are very badly put, bad, badly formulated. And I realized that many of our specialists, uh, the, the, when they wanted to talk generally about vaccination, they often didn't do it really very, very well. And so when we talked about specific vaccines, and so I emerged from these two worlds, the scientific world, but also as a parent in, in my village. But there was much too much uh, 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 amalgamation and too, many, too much beliefs in, uh, blind beliefs in, vac in vaccination. 
And I realize it is a scientific medical topic like the, like, uh, like the others, so I want to attack it in a very pragmatic way, and that's sort of the notion, the, uh, the goal that I set myself to give up on this idea of vaccination, but I wanted to treat vaccines as drugs, as, uh, as, as medication, not to, make, do, to write an account just on the vaccine, vaccine one or two, but I wanted to use this, this work in a pragmatic way so that we could uh, uh, challenge other aspects and other values, uh, uh, legal, economic, uh, in, in relation to uh, uh, generalized vaccines. Could you come back to the method that you used? to proceed with your book. I think the starting point, I think, was this monograph that I did two years ago, where I both coordinated the articles that were that contributed to it uh, about, about the past in medicines, vaccines, and uh, the future of vaccines. And I also uh, uh, studied on the guide of vaccines, uh, vaccine by vaccine. And my procedure was pretty much the same as, as for most of my articles. That is, I, I hover around the, the, the central topic itself and uh, various things which have been validated and published and approved by a, a peer review for, for each uh, pathogen that I studied. And, and after that, there came with the desire to be, find myself to be right in the middle of the concerns of parents uh, based on the principle that their question, uh, the questioning is legitimate and that perhaps I had, uh, I had a little more interest in it than just any, uh, any normal person as a scientific journalist because of my own children uh, having to be vaccinated. And so I have uh, easier access to experts myself because of my past in scientific journalism. And that was the process I used pretty much uh, using my scientific background, but also my immersion in parenting uh, concerning the uh, technology related to uh, vaccinations and vaccines. And so you, you have described an approach which is very rational and also the entering into an environment where the myths and the beliefs uh, are very present uh, in people's minds uh, on all sides of the issue uh, in the debate about vaccination. Could you tell us a little about how the, your desire to f flesh out these arguments were greeted by the people you talked to? by necessary uh, are against some people's uh, uh, profoundest beliefs. So generally speaking, the welcome was, fair, it was favorable generally uh, by parents and also the medical co uh, corps. But, uh, yeah, in indeed, I, uh, there were a few questions that, that arose and a certain friction with some of the researchers that I, I talked to. Uh, throughout my investigation, and I didn't want to talk too much into it. I, I didn't want to get involved in too much controversy, and because if, if I getting stuck in a controversy, uh, it was giving much more importance to some of the questions I had to ask than really deserved it. And so my positioning was was just the opposite. That is, I didn't want to make people mistrust me. I, the amount of uh, information that, that can come from controversy when I'm talking to the people, uh, I didn't want to sort of divulge everything that, uh, that I was thinking at the time because I really wanted to listen to the people to hear what they have to say. And, and so uh, putting it in the balance about the general uh, advantages of vaccination, but I realized uh, during my investigation that sort of the unknown that generates a uh, certain mistrust uh, toward vaccinations and vaccines. And I wanted to put the known elements and unknown elements on the table uh, that contribute to the controversies 
and to try to reassure the parents, notably. And so I had several conversations which were sometimes a bit tense with these researchers, people from the Institute Pasteur, uh, who, I, in, uh, I think, in my opinion, that they they are often very linked, other in another way, more more attached to the vaccines than they are to the subjects who get vaccinated. And in particular, I talked to a colleague who talked to me about, who spoke to me, not about a conflict of interest, but not that it doesn't exist, but it was. But in the mechanics of it, there was more a thing about intellectual and loyalty toward the pro products that they worked on for a lot of the researchers that uh, that was, who have spent their life uh, working on vaccines. And I also brought up a, a less uh, a less shining example in the it's sort of a, a backstabbing with the Institu uh, Institut Pasteur because uh, sometimes they just wouldn't accept, uh, in fact, some of the point uh, point of view. And uh, some t we are no longer in a situation that we were, where we were a hundred years ago, and what is being asked for today is much more transparency and to go beyond uh, just the the speak uh, speechifying and also the myths of uh, medication but, but to, to get to something much more material i also received some strong criticism from uh, from the anti-vaccination people who consider that i wrote i have written a book which is that i was bought by the industrialists and I, I was nothing more than a spokeswoman of of of, the, uh, of their on their behalf. And so, as you can see, I was criticized from both sides, and uh, especially when I talked about what interests me the most. A question for Lise, and after that, I'm going to give you sort of an idea of some of the questions that uh, about uh, in relation to the individual and the choice for, uh, of vaccinations. In France, even last year, in 2016, there was a big conference, uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, grand consultation of a citizen meeting last year in France in 2016, and uh, we and this issue indeed came up about vaccination, and it's something that we have a difficult time perhaps talking about it in France because in public health terms we find it it is a weight on our shoulders and after this uh, consultation this national consultation that we had in, uh, in medicine terms medical terms and so we wanted to be associated with it and for, with citizens it took several months there were about 40 experts who uh, qualified people who uh, who gave conferences gave speeches about it in the consultation with the conclusion the conclusions were drawn from it by saying and the recommendations are now starting to emerge from what was decided on about the obligation to uh, be vaccinated in France. Perhaps we could salute this effort uh, uh, of the national uh, uh, conference and we think about that. I think I think indeed we can salute the, the effort of this uh, national consultation. And after that, there's the implementation of this uh, consultation, which was associated with the public health in France and to other uh, bodies, more independent, who and I think it's up to them to organize this kind of debate, indeed, for the future. But what seemed to me a shame a little bit with the consultation is that there were very interesting debates and there were discussions with both the policymakers and the citizens and expert panels, and which were very stimulating and interesting. What was sad in the end for me was that the summing up of this consultation, and especially on the, uh, the idea of obliga obligatory vaccination, it was rather a vertical uh, conclusion. That is, the organ organizational committee uh, about 12 or 15 experts, uh, tra uh, transdisciplinary uh, uh, in, in the fields, uh, with the with the conclusions being that the their conclusions of these 12, 15 people without didn't take into consideration all the contributions of the various committees that had met uh, and discussed, 
uh, banned on, obli on the obligatory vaccination, uh, that was flagrant. And the, the expert, the, the expert uh, panel agreed that they should extend the obligatory vaccination, and the Citizens Committee didn't really make up a decision, make up their minds on it. They were about 50-50 on it. And so during the consultation, we had the feeling that all the eminent people, they felt that we should extend the, the vaccination program in France, but the others were not so much in agreement. And there were more than 10,000 uh, uh, contributors to it. But the only work that was really done in uh, uh, to quantify in the terms that with the terms that came back the most often the terms that came up in uh, uh, the most often was the idea of uh, obligation as a negative aspect of it. The 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 summary of this consultation the summary would have gone in the sense of a suggestion of getting rid of the obligations uh, of vaccination. And we realized that the decision to, to, be a, uh, to, to agree with this, uh, the, the conclusions of the citizens' conference, the consultation, uh, in fact, had more to do with these 12 or 15, it came from these 12 or 15 people only, and that all the other people that had been consulted, in fact, hadn't really seemed to make a contribution. Uh, in French law, uh, uh, we call it the law of, of, of March 4th from 2002, which in the end, among the most notorious parts of it, is the, the, this issue of consentment, of consent by the patients. And so they have to consent to a vaccinations. And so I don't know how we can oppose ourselves to this uh, uh, obligatory vaccination. I think it's one of the topics indeed uh, in public health in France anyway. But this issue of, co uh, of consent also uh, has an echo with us here at MSF as well. And that is the need for consent and the need to validate the care uh, by the patient. And it's also it raises an issue for us at MSF because we can wonder now about consent to vaccination in our practices. I don't know how each of us considers it today, but it, should a patient have a total choice or, or whatever? But the people who come to see us, uh, do, do we, do, are they properly informed about what is entailed with the vaccination and are all the treatments, are they explained? And how are we going to be able to get into this issue and to be, we have to be as realistic as possible, obviously, in this situation. But to have the moral consent of the people and by the community, by individuals, uh, and all culturally and environmentally, is it uh, something that uh, we are taking enough into consideration? And even through the various countries in which we work, they sometimes don't exactly have the same practices as we do either. And so I haven't got an lot, awful lot of solutions concerning consent because uh, in a mass uh, vaccination campaign, for example, it's very difficult but to, to be able to have consultations in uh, OPD, uh, uh, outpatients clinics, and so people come, they come to us in, uh, in a mass with the mass arrival and it's very difficult to, uh, to explain to them and to be able to have consent from each, each individual is often a very difficult thing when we have uh, an EPI, for example. And with, with, with all the ins and outs of the medical acts and to be able to explain that to the individuals is often very difficult to do. We try to do it uh, uh, we do, uh, when we ask the people if they've understood what we've said to them. Uh, I, I have a memory, uh, the, uh, an inv investigation was done when we explained to the people how we to use uh, the, uh, the NRS and people, uh, within we were, they, when the people were asked afterwards if they understood the, in, uh, the instructions that we gave, they often weren't, weren't able to answer the questions. There's the moral consent, is that enough? Uh, once again, I think uh, 
I don't think there is a universal answer we can give to that issue about moral consent. The second issue uh, uh, about the care that we give through vaccines, and we see this in the group, we're trying to globalize the, uh, the account a little bit. And we also have to deconstruct a little bit to try and find out. Uh, and, that, and the book, I think, does that very well because uh, does, is it going to work everywhere? Is vaccina vaccinating everybody, is that a possibility? But the first uh, observation we can make is that medicine is, is moving more and more toward the individualization, personalization of care. And, and that is uh, true on the vaccine level as well. That may be a real illusion that we have here at MSF. But it seems to me that that is a development which is a fairly natural procedure that uh, we are personalizing medicine more and more. And a vaccine is not a weapon either. There are several kinds of vaccines. There are vaccines for, for preventing diseases and also for curing diseases. You have therapeutic vaccines for cancer and HIV, that is, we have to, re to, 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 to get the uh, immune system going again. That's what those vaccines are used for. And uh, at the, uh, the Pasteur Institute, that is uh, with some of the things they are stu studying very carefully. Uh, to show that uh, vaccine is a very common element and that uh, we have to warn people as much as possible. And the final point, is the uh, the genetic cures, but I think it's something which is still too complicated, too much to talk about. That is genetic uh, vaccination. And so, what are we going to do to be able to personalize things? We're going to try to optimize situations and the decision-making situations to be able to define uh, the the people that we want to vac uh, vaccinate. And so, these are some of the criteria that we have to take into consideration at MSF. But I, we talked about being rational a little bit earlier, but it's not just a purely uh, rational thing. I think you have a financial aspect to it that comes into it, uh, even for very simple viruses. The HPV, uh, as we see, is meant we are vaccinating young, uh, young women today uh, and that they, and this is carried, uh, that is disease carried by men. And for, for, for money reasons, these vaccines can cost an awful lot of money, and the cost of the vaccine also, also fashions the way, in fact, that we uh, approach the topic, uh, despite the epidemiological arguments that may go into it. And we vaccinate at MSF, and we use these uh, vaccines, but the arguments are both financial and medical but not necessarily very epidemiological. Uh, access to care also can be a factor about populations who are going to need such and such a vaccine, for example, we've seen, like the rotavirus, uh, with uh, very serious cases the, uh, between, and so, uh, and the uh, child hydration, for example, and the hospital care, but we haven't got any concerns much on that level because the vaccines are imperative in the countries where we work. It's, a, it's something com completely different. The rotavirus, for example, gives us something entirely different. And so... There are political arguments against us. A good example is the PCG in North America and Canada. Uh, people are vaccinated, not in the United States. The difference, there are differences between these two countries, but uh, all this is much more based on a political decision rather than epidemiological or medical uh, grounds. And uh, the arguments to use a vaccine or to define a target group are much more based on uh, business or commercial consideration. The dengue vaccine is difficult to use. That was the case for the flu as well, when it was recommended when there was the 2010 uh, H1N1 uh, flu virus. Uh, it was known that there were some um, interests that uh, ruled uh, the decision-making process. Now, 
No, these decisions are not always very logical or uh, rational. And uh, one very good example she takes in her book is that of the three mandatory vaccines, because uh, the three mandatory vaccines in France were up until uh, January next uh, are not are those vaccines that are some if that do ha are, uh, have efficacy, but. Uh, um, those, not all the diseases are uh, transmissible diseases like uh, tetanus, for instance, or uh, locked jaw, or diphtheria, or poliomyelitis. Maybe the approach here is uh, just a, a historical reason. The three mandatory vaccines in France have no epidemiological justification at all. In terms of avoided uh, sequela, these are were the very first vaccines which were generalized in France at the time when uh, the obligation was the cornerstone of many other policies. And what I've uh, highlighted in my book is the uh, lack of consistency between the official or formal statements of the public authorities who have uh, quite often emphasized uh, the need for solidarity. You vaccinate yourself to protect yourself and to protect the others. And that's true for some diseases. But for these three ones, diphtheria, tetanus, and poliomyelitis, these are the most selfish vaccines of the uh, vaccine schedule. Tetanus, obviously, uh, the vaccine will only protect uh, the uh, infected person. It's not a contagious or transmissible disease. Diphtheria uh, uh, will be uh, carried and transmitted even though you have the vaccine. Uh, that's for uh, uh, diphtheria is only uh, the toxin you may be the carrier of the bacteria and transmit to, to, to somebody else as well. So I've picked this example of these three diseases, these three vaccines to uh, highlight the inconsistencies of these uh, two broad general statements and uh, speeches that uh, do uh, generate uh, mistrust because as soon as you feel there's a flaw in the official statements, you feel that you're being fooled around uh, with the argument of solidarity, but that's an abuse of solidarity to a certain extent because the laws have uh, uh, carried the obligation of uh, these vaccines that are, are not uh, carrying these values of solidarity. These three mandatory vaccines are the ones that were not the most generous one, while we always put uh, forward the uh, generous so-called nature of vaccines. On our side, uh, we have target groups are identified. We have a political uh, statements, and we will see how the big mottos uh, that are highlighted by some of them can be a problem or a pitfall for us. Another question to you. Picking up on what Emmanuel said about the list of justifications and grounds and reasons for the obligation of vaccines in France, the political, economic, and health-based uh, rationale. Which of those arguments were the ones that were uh, most highlighted? And maybe, uh, maybe uh, we could talk about the ex expected uh, benefits or profit for the pharma industry. Uh, we've often heard that uh, the winners of this new law are the uh, pharma companies. And they're often uh, being uh, shown as being the baddies in the story. Well, justification to move from three to 11 mandatory vaccines. Well, first of all, I'd like to underscore that there is no epidemiological ground to this law. First of all, when you consider the uh, coverage rates, they've all been on the rise over the last years. It is true that for three uh, vaccines, uh, the uh, coverage rates are below the recommended uh, limits, that is for measles, uh, 
meningococcus and hepatitis B were still below uh, what is recommended. But uh, there is no decrease in the coverage rates over the last year, so there is no emergency uh, that would justify such uh, governmental decision. To me, the main reason for this law is uh, mainly based on legal grounds. The French uh, Conseil d'État, the uh, highest uh, state council, uh, council was uh, criticized uh, because uh, the three mandatory vaccines were no longer uh, found and made available with the three valences, and their uh, duty was to meet the demand, which was expressed uh, by uh, various patient organizations so that uh, a single vaccine with these three valences would be made available. And here we also feel and see the limits of the uh, influence of a state when it comes to changing the formulation designed by the pharma company. They've realized it would be much more difficult to uh, meet this demand. And rather than either lifting all obligations or extending all obligations. And out of these two alternatives, they've decided to extend the obligation and include a higher number of vaccines. We've often heard that this decision came, was made under the pressure of the industry so that uh, their profits would go up. And I took the uh, time to consider these three valences that I have uh, studied. And uh, they will be mechanically increased by this law. And I thought that uh, everything that would be below 90% should reach 92% if uh, these vaccines become mandatory in, within a year. And then I've considered the price of each of these vaccines and I've considered what would be the profit per uh, pharma company based on uh, comparing it with their current uh, revenue, but it would not increase by more than 0.5 percent the uh, vaccine's revenue for these pharma companies. So to me, this argument of saying that it's only to uh, uh, make a pharma company richer is not an argument that is uh, valid to me. I'd like to pick up on what you we've said earlier. It is true that uh, it seems today that vaccines are uh, um, against the current of history, the flaws of history. Uh, informed consent, the freedom of patients did not exist in the past. While well, this is something that is increasingly highlighted in our countries today, and indeed, uh, the uh, mass campaigning uh, are going against this trend of uh, individualized informed consent. And it's true that medicine uh, is going to uh, through a new trend of uh, customization and vaccination are uh, not in along those lines anymore. So we are at a time when uh, vaccines are a, a, a bit of a challenge of questioning us because uh, they were based on a vision of medicine, which is no longer the one we observe today. And there were also some political influences because ultimately it was a political decision which was made. You've talked about the legal arguments. Well, from the political standpoint, I think that the driver in the decision made by the minister was the fear of being criticized for uh, avoidable deaths uh, due to the diseases uh, covered by these vaccines. And indeed, we could have had another outbreak of measles like uh, the one we had in France between 2008 and 2011, where some uh, 12 deaths were reported and 1,500 irreversible uh, neurological sequela. Uh, so uh, it's uh, more difficult to uh, take responsibility for it rather than uh, imposing this obligation of vaccines. 
and uh, councillors, lawyers have really uh, looked into that and wanted to see whether it was a an opposition with the Kushner law of 2002 uh, about the informed consent of patients. And I don't know how they came to this conclusion, but one has to realize that uh, uh, parents are not obliged to be vaccinated, but children who do not have their vaccines will not have access to, uh, you know, uh, child centers and kindergartens and schools and things like that. Uh, that is, uh, you know, child mind instructors will not host children if they're not vaccinated. But uh, there will no longer be criminal proceedings and fines under the new French law. We're talking about the French minister and a political decision, but it was voted by the members of parliament, of the French parliament. So uh, uh, there were other ways to oppose it. So it's true that uh, the uh, uh, politicization, making this uh, political issue uh, is really important. And there's something that uh, weights on uh, the uh, shoulders of MSF that uh, what we need to address. So you have the uh, uh, Millennium Development Goals and today the uh, Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, there is some emphasis on the research and development for new vaccines. And uh, this uh, motto of uh, healthcare for access to healthcare uh, amongst uh, the 17 um, sustainable development goals. So the objective is that everybody should be in good health with no diseases, etc., etc. I see Ronnie nodding hearing such a motto. No, vaccination is a part of it. So we. Uh, don't apply this every day, but uh, there is another political motto that we uh, uh, hear that is in the background, which is eradication, elimination. I'm thinking more of uh, poliomyelitis and also HIV elimination has been discussed as well as that of measles, and uh, it still is on the agenda. No, whether this is achievable or not is another issue, but the elimination of polio is something that we've uh, worked on. We've uh, studied this under the aegis of Claire Magon, who's here in this room. And I think that the objective, and that's what we said with Claire at that time, is that uh, the, uh, the effort is certainly commendable. The uh, number of polio cases uh, we uh, that are reported today has nothing to do and does not compare with what was reported 10 or 20 years ago. But uh, there was even huge effort, and we have some legitimacy to talk about our healthcare staff that is exposed, the healthcare staff that is exposed to. Uh, hostile population. Some nurses were killed uh, in some cases, and we didn't want to make them uh, martyrs. Uh, that was not the right attitude. There was a very strong opposition to this concept of elimination of a disease in some countries, uh, with no surprise, because beyond uh, the uh, arguments which were opposing uh, the uh, elimination, uh, such as uh, spying and things like that. Uh, there uh, was a consideration for other groups of priority people. For in Pakistan, who, what is the priority for a family? Is it the fact that uh, children have a polio vaccination or that uh, they are protected from uh, pneumopathies and diarrhea? That is diseases that are having, uh, taking a much higher toll of children every day. And in your book, Lise, you're taking a very good as an example. What is important uh, for a young Parisian child? Is it the protection against pollution or against poliomyelitis? So uh, coming up with automatic uh, answers is certainly not the uh, solution. We should certainly question ourselves about that and try to disentangle all this. Uh, when it comes to uh, the vaccine obligation in France and the uh, policy or politically based arguments. And we should not respond in an abrupt way and uh, take in all the big mottos and uh, support them. I know that it was recently discussed for HIV, but it could be also the case for many other topics.
a bit of, you know, nuances and pinch of salt, says Emmanuel. The question of elimination or eradication of a disease raises the problem of uh, intergenerational sustainability of a vaccination policy. And that's something I had not assessed. Decisions which were made before we were born are actually pushing us to make choices which wouldn't have been our choices if our grandparents had made different choices. And for smallpox, for instance, we no longer uh, worry about it. We're very happy that we're no longer exposed to this uh, uh, disease. and. Uh, and not being vaccinated because the vaccine was uh, causing a lot of uh, reactions. And polio is now at the heart of many debates. And if we want to be rational and realize that today the vaccine generates not uh, the oral vaccine, has more uh, side effects than the actual cases uh, of uh, polio due to the wild virus. But what is the value of a future free of polio? That is a future where we no longer have to carry on with these mass vaccination campaigns. These are extremely complex questions that are uh, raised today uh, with measles this objective of elimination of measles. Is it a valid objective? Is it achievable? And uh, shall we commit ourselves to meet this objective because it will help to raise funds? And that's often what is uh, highlighted for uh, in supporting the eradication of polio. Why often, why we often hear is that uh, there was such a thrill uh, for this that uh, unprecedented funds were raised and it would not have been possible to have such a routine vaccination uh, campaign without having this uh, goal of eradicating, eliminating uh, polio. No. The next disease on the list is uh, measles. No, is it only a liver? a financial one, or is it something that really makes sense for today, but also for the future generations? I think that these uh, debates are not well uh, led, you know, within WHO and other organizations such as UNICEF and maybe MSF. No. When it comes to informed consent and consent, as was raised by uh, Emmanuel, and uh, since we have here in this room some people from the medical department of MSF, what are the uh, solutions that we are providing as an institution for the informed consent of patients, both for routine vaccinations and for massive uh, immunization campaigns. I was wondering if somebody from the medical department here in this room would respond. Claire, you do, you can speak English, Claire. Just speak in the microphone. Um, just a couple of comments, I'm, because I'm not French, and I think uh, the French context is a bit specific. Um, and I think in many different countries there are similar discussions. But I think it's important to also see uh, does making vaccination compulsory actually work? In the country I came from, it's not compulsory, although there are obligations to have um, vaccination if you go to preschool uh, or school, but it's pretty loose. It's not a big punishment if you don't. 
Um, but we have a very effective vaccine buying uh, institution, which gets good vaccines at very cheap. We have free access to primary care. We have a commitment to equity, to vaccinating the kids that need it most. And in all districts in New Zealand now, for the 10 uh, antigens, the coverage is between 90 and 95%. 10 years ago, it was where I live, 60%. Um, maybe 15 years ago, but certainly quite recently. Um, and within MSF, we're working in contexts where children will benefit a lot more than children in France or in New Zealand from these vaccines. And the reason I became a lot more interested in vaccination was because I worked for MSF. When I was a doctor in New Zealand, vaccination, not very interesting. In New Zealand, nurses do it all anyway. But when you see children die of measles, it changes your mind. As you said, it's the personal experience that does make a difference. If you've seen people in, with polio, uh, the last person who had polio in New Zealand was in an iron lung in the hospital where I worked as a student still. It's quite impressive. Of course it makes a difference. So as you say also in the book, the vaccines are a victim of their own success in our countries. But I don't believe they should be compulsory. And I don't believe that MSF s says they should be compulsory. I think... Um, in many of the communities where we work, people actively want their children to be vaccinated because they've seen other children die of those diseases. So yes, we could do a lot better at communicating better about vaccination. Um, and we could do probably better about getting more informed consent, for sure. But I don't believe that MSF advocates for compulsory vaccination. But I'm quite new here, so I could be wrong. <laughs> Please introduce myself, uh, Pauline. I work on the medical department on vaccination. And I'd like to add one thing. The objectives that you have reminded Emmanuel are mm, the WHO objectives, there are mainly WHO objectives and that are the vaccination policy at MSF. It does not really converge with that of WHO. We're rather uh, in favor of vaccination of children above the age of one and to have a response to outbreaks, access to uh, underused vaccines. Uh, so we're not uh, politically in line with the WHO policies, even though sometimes we are subject to WHO policies in some countries. If, of course, the MSF decision was not to uh, blindly uh, follow what uh, WHO was advocating for, and it's true sometimes that the big mottos are uh, returned to us by the ministries because they want us to apply policies that we would not necessarily apply. I do appreciate a lot this uh, discussion, but when it comes to choice and the freedom to choose the, you know, newborns and babies, infants uh, cannot uh, give you an informed consent. Uh, it's true for any surgical procedure as well or any medical uh, intervention. In many locations, indeed, the parents uh, f will make the decision for their children. But here you're talking about a, a massive uh, vaccination campaigns. And I have no trust whatsoever in parents. <laughs> Liz, I'd like to respond to the first comment. And I do uh, agree with this point of view. And I think that when we observe the increase of the uh, coverage rates in France over the last year, years, 
Uh, through uh, an improved communication and information, we could have had a 90% uh, coverage in France in five to 10 years. What is often uh, said by the health authorities in France is that the mistrust in the general population is so high, so they refer to the international survey which was published a year ago in 60 countries. Uh, this survey was asking very broad, general questions about vaccination. One of the questions was, do you think that vaccines are safe? And 40% of the French people answered no or rather no. Therefore, France was considered as uh, one of the countries where the uh, mistrust in vaccines is the highest. But me, the question was so broad and overarching that you cannot really conclude that 40% of the French population is opposed to vaccines. That's not true. And in reality, it is uh, just uh, disclosing the fact that some vaccines are raising questions and issues. And we've had several uh, health scandals in France. I'm thinking of hepatitis B vaccination campaign in the 1990s, which was poorly managed, uh, particularly at the end, and uh, left a major toma, a trauma. And I'm also thinking about a H1N1 2009 vaccination campaign, which was just a mess in France. And for all these reasons, I wouldn't say it is crazy that uh, some of us are wondering about uh, these uh, specific vaccines. And some of us might have indeed answered that, no, they do not trust vaccines indeed. So maybe there was a misinterpretation in these sociological studies and surveys that were far too uh, over-encompassing and that we shouldn't talk about vaccination in general, but we should deal with this topic, vaccine per vaccine. And as I said, uh, there is uh, uh, politicians are fearing the boomerang effect of uh, some outbreaks, like there was uh, the measles uh, outbreak in 2008, 2011, which was really a, a, a severe outbreak compared with our neighboring countries. And indeed, infants will never provide an informed consent. I'm And I think that indeed there could be some collective intelligence in parents. And I'm thinking about the French setting, and I'm not thinking of the uh, massive campaigns that you can have for polio when uh, healthcare professionals and nurses go door to door in some countries. But I think that uh, the uh, uh, we will achieve long-lasting and better results when parents uh, are allowed to be informed, to understand the interest, the benefits of uh, vaccines. And, uh, from what I've understood, from what you said, the idea is that in 10 to 15 years from now, all obligations will be lifted. Uh, the minister is hoping that in the meantime, this uh, during these 15 years, uh, trust and confidence of the French population will be restored. But this will have to go hand in hand with a huge effort in terms of communication. Uh, but at the same time, and get, getting rid and the possible and the and the possible criminalization in case there is not non-vaccination. And so, what I uh, said, so according to what you said, Emmanuel, what do you think about the difficulty of understanding about the use of uh, of some of these rare vaccines? We could also uh, ask questions about about informed cons consent in a more general way, keeping in mind that people haven't necessarily understand for many various reasons. But the uh, poor understanding of the situation could be a part of the common rules. And in, su in, in, in that regard, it's uh, sometimes it's necessary that decisions have to be made according to gr expert groups who lead us to believe that the benefits in relation to the risks are much uh, more positive than the negative. 
And so I know, I know, I know it's a, it's it's a, it's an argumentative point, but I I don't, uh, but I I share your opinion with myself. But what I mean is that now our positions aren't necessarily opposed here. I'm not saying that all parents have to understand in detail the the advantages and the the inconveniences of each vaccine. And because I have a hard, hard enough time myself, even though I'm a scientific journalist, to understand some of the details on the other hand. But I do claim that by making an effort of communication and information and being as transparent as possible and considering all the issues, uh, issues as uh, legitimate, uh, I think uh, when, instead of sweeping it under the carpet, uh, it's one of the less uh, shining aspects of vaccination. I think what we have to do is we have to we are going to promote the trust by parents toward their toward their toward their physicians and toward the authorities, and once this trust has been restored, I think indeed after that, if our doctors re recommend that uh, we don't vaccinate, we are the parents are not going to head off in the direction. Uh, for uh, or looking for hidden things uh, behind what the doctor says, the more transparent we try to be, uh, the more the more we are able to follow up the instructions without having to go into gr too great a detail. Uh, perhaps one more point on that, rather before giving the floor to Emmanuel. The fact is that on the strategy of the fight against polio uh, uh, and even in France or, or the bachelor campaign against the flu in 2010. These two strategies in those cases, we can only note that there was a legitimate controversy that it gave rise to because it was very badly indicated why the flu, the flu uh, vaccination was very important. And for example, not only it has to do with the safety of the uh, staff in hospital and also the deterioration of the trust of, uh, by people in particular, especially for the vaccine itself, but in a more general way, that is that the campaign uh, was the subject of a uh, highly repeated message and uh, the, that is to fight the, the flu. Uh, 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 with the, pay, uh, the patents taken out by the pharmaceutical industry, now to be able to just blindly trust the authorities and to give them absolute trust and to adopt in, in relation to the user and the parents, that seems to me a little bit that's something we have to challenge, I think. And so we can save that for the discussion a little bit later. And so a reaction by Emmanuel before we giving uh, any reactions to that from the floor? I, I'm a doctor at, uh, at the Hôpital Saint Antoine. I work in the consultation for HIV and, 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 uh, and three-fourths of the adults don't know if they're being vaccinated for hepatitis B or not in relation to the HIV. And as a result, the, there is a awareness raising in relation to HIV that we have to do, but also in, in tandem with the uh, hepatitis B, especially toward the younger young adults, and to help them decide right, the, the advantages of it or the disadvantages. There's, a, there's another point that seems interesting that we talk about this evening is about the cost of uh, vaccines, and especially the new vaccines. And it's very well explained, but it's something and it's understood and, and known and uh, discussed in public. The new vaccines are more, cost much more money than the more traditional vaccines. And some, the vaccine market is, 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 is extending, uh, not just for the pharmaceutical industry, but it's for everybody. But the vaccine uh, for pneumococcus, for example, uh, by the Pfizer industries uh, reach, uh, uh, have fairly big profits on it. And, and for us and for the populations uh, in the countries where we work, uh, the, the access to these vaccines, the, the, the issue of the accessing these, exceeding uh, these, uh, these vaccines is, is, is being asked. And we are trying to answer in two parallel ways. The first is the way that we, I might call activist, a militant, 
it's more medical aspect. The activists have, uh, that it is that uh, that we used in, in the Fair Shot campaign uh, for uh, essential campaigns, and particularly in Paris, which consisted in, as you saw. Uh, of challenging uh, f the Pfizer publicly for the price of the of the vaccine, asking them to drop the price to make it possible for MSF teams and other medical people to be able to be able to procure this vaccine. Another parallel process was uh, engaged, uh, which is now c concluded in emergency situations and o and only in emergency situations. That is, vaccines which are much more affordable in uh, crisis situations. And I think it has to be assessed. Uh, that is the effect of the campaign because it, it did mobilize a lot of people uh, around it. But I think it'd be very interesting to, to, to do a study on that. But it's true that we will be there with the idea of having vaccines developed by, by the northern countries and try to adapt them uh, and to get to, to get the prices to drop down according to this this specificities in the countries where we're working another paradigm that comes into it that it's possible to, to look at is that msf has also considered is that of acting upstream on the development of vaccines and to make it in such a way that the people are are created for the places where we work the most recent example is developing the vaccine against uh, for rotavirus and diarrheas uh, that is very uh, frequent and pre prevalent in the countries where we work, where we saw the development of, uh, of vaccines. It's not completely finished yet. And so we, uh, it isn't completely concluded yet, but MSF has carried its influence uh, for the development of this vaccine and also influence the specificities of the vaccine, the fact that it's a vaccine which is uh, thermal stable and, uh, and also with a, at a low cost. And so what is interesting is to work in uh, from a different point of view uh, under a certain uh, a different kind of paradigm to ask the industrialists to uh, adapt themselves to the needs and not necessarily just try to sell it on the market for their best price. The partnership with a vaccine producer in the South is also something which is fairly edifying for us. So I think there are two ways to be able to tackle these things, certainly in parallel and certainly in a complementary way. But now it remains what position we are going to adopt in relation to all the vaccines which have undeveloped for certain pathologies and also the new vaccines. So we see this with the, uh, the rotavirus uh, vaccine. And so on this issue of developing new vaccines, for me, there is a real question has to be asked. Uh, Lise, how do you have the feeling today that governments are able, they have a, a will to defend uh, this attitude and uh, with, in relation to certain vaccines today, it's not just hepatitis C, but other kinds of uh, similar uh, vaccines. And so our government's getting engaged and defending this possible, uh, the, 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 the compulsory vaccines are uh, reimbursed 100% and the others are, have to be paid for with uh, mutual insurance, uh, complementary insurance. And so the increased uh, medication on the field in France is not going to increase the price. Now, from an economic point of view, in France, when you ha when a new vaccine comes onto the market, you have a whole process for uh, for validating it to be able to generalize it, and then it's given over to a public health committee, and that's where the negotiation of the prices are carried out. If I've understood correctly, the industrialists come with a price which which we call the willingness to pay, that is, the French are willing to pay how much for such and such a, a vaccine, and then the neg negotiations are carried out uh, about the cost, uh, about the cost efficiency. Uh, to be able to, uh, this uh, rotavirus vaccine, to come back to that issue, it was offered uh, upon the recommendations in France and before putting that on the schedule, 
the issue was put between the economic evaluators that explain that at the price of the vaccine, it was not uh, cost efficient in France. And they put the argument forward that that is going to reduce the number of hospitalizations in France, admissions to hospitals in France. Uh, and so that was one of the arguments. It could be an element in the argument. The fact that the admissions to hospitals are, are reduced because of the use of this vaccine, even if it is fairly pricey. Because, but as such, and in, its, in itself, the price was much too high individually. But then if you look at other aspects of, uh, in fact, the, the effects of, 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 of the vaccine, then perhaps it is more justified. And so this vaccine, which in reality, uh, in France, it, it has no serious uh, consequences. Uh, in some 20 countries, we have realized that the vaccines were used in terms of public health, but nonetheless, it is offered in a, in a large number of rich countries in Germany, in Netherlands, in England, I think. And somebody put forth the idea that that this uh, putting this on the market of a vaccine, which is not so so uh, cost efficient in terms of public health in a country like ours, if it didn't enable it somewhere to offer a, a different price in the countries that need it the most by ensuring the, the producer uh, that it will be a profitable market and that once the profitable market uh, has been acquired, uh, they would then are going to get, permit themselves to be able to increase the prices uh, to the limit of what the market is able to sustain. And so we presented this idea as international solidarity. That is, we use this product uh, on, a, on a market where it may not be all that useful, but it may enable other countries to be able to use it more on the market uh, according to their needs. Uh, we ha that has to be demonstrated, on the other hand. And we saw that. And they, they talked about this in terms of, of uh, medicines. That is, the, the patents and protecting the medicines is going to enable the pharmaceutical industry to be able to work at a loss, uh, for, for to be able to develop uh, medicines for the southern countries. And we demonstrated at MSF, and MSF contributed to this, that it wasn't true, that the number of innovations are very weak uh, in the northern I think there are about four innovations of new medicines in 30 years or something like that. And it was, it was, that was about the magnitude of it. In any case, it was indeed, uh, there was no relation between protecting a drug to be able to develop further. It's, that just doesn't exist. And this uh, international solidarity is kind of a curious as an argument, because if you're going to vaccinate for something which it doesn't serve much of a purpose in the north, whereas in the south, it could be very, it seems to be kind of a tortuous argument. These uh, vaccines which are developed to be used in the northern country, they're, de they're developed for the specifics of the conditions which are not the same as in our countries as in the southern countries. As we said earlier, the number of the injections and the, the volume of vaccination as well. Um, I, I think the Rota X uh, assumes a volume in transport and for storing uh, these vaccines, which is extremely complicated. Uh, and, all, which, and, and its use is even more complicated. After about three, uh, 10 years of pre-qualification by WHO, uh, that in fact it's not even reaching the countries where it was supposed to be reaching. And so I really and frankly haven't got an opinion on this. If the Italian government, uh, I don't really know for what reason that they have decided not to be able to sell this in the country. Uh, whence the interest, in my opinion, that it be associated from the beginning with uh, developing vaccines and to be able to respond to specific needs of specific countries, and uh, then how? And so when you talk about the price of these new vaccines uh, and how 
uh, at the negotiation between you and the pharmaceutical industry, uh, this is this is a joint work that we have to carry out. Uh, for example, with root virus, uh, there was a big Indian manufacturer that is uh, is uh, practically uh, manufacturing all the uh, practically all the uh, the medicines that we uh, uh, use in our projects, and the models that they use, and I think it could be spread to other companies. The developmental costs and the, uh, and the production costs are the same, aren't they? No, the production costs are not the same because the, because the vaccine doesn't work exactly in the same way that medicines do. It, it, it another, but the investment isn't exactly the same. It's more a generic uh, medicine, which, which, uh, which the companies that we know uh, and the four the four major companies that you 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 quoted in the book of Pfizer and the others, but to be able to qualify for pre qualification with, with WHO, I mean the medicines uh, when we are used with them, the vaccines are pre qualified since twenty uh, starting from twenty seventeen. It's one of the possible ac uh, actions that we could carry out. All some of the other vaccines that MSF might be able to get uh, interested in might be a, a combination therapy with pneumococcus for pneumococcus, and another one, uh, typhoid. There is space still uh, to be uh, that we could be present where and we to demonstrate the, the possibility. Uh, what works the best and, uh, and what is most effective, uh, I think we'll, we'll learn about that in the future. But for us, that is uh, a part of the public debate. It's always been a part of what we discuss at MSF. It's the same for the vaccines and other aspects of our work at MSF. And for nutrition, nutritional products, for example, working upstream on the specifications and explain what are the needs in the field and not just to try to reproduce. Uh, it's it's like the use of to Toyotas in the field, for example. Same thing in the in the vaccines. With with it's a bit more complicated with medicines than it is something like uh, something like the Toyotas, for example. If we look in the back with the with the medicines market, how do you react with the new uh, partnerships which you have created with the industrialist people in the emerging countries? As long as uh, the, I think the uh, uh, rotavirus is, uh, is produced in the countries where we work often. Uh, another example which is very telling is the meningitis A vaccine because the tens of thousands of cases where MSF has uh, intervened in the Sahel in the early in the 2000s. One of the new projects of the conjugate uh, vaccines were put on the table, and and the the traditional uh, manufacturers were not interested in it. So we addressed the an Indian company, and they were more interested in it. And so we worked with them to be able to develop this vaccine, this Menafrivac, which uh, now vaccinates. The the young population in the Sahel uh, area region. And so we obviously can't do everything. We can't get involved in all the shavits. We have to choose our battles. But there are moments where we could uh, we could weigh in with our <clears throat> with our own opinion uh, in for epidemics and also for day to day medicine. And so these are specifics of our of our profession. Uh, toward the populations we work with, if we just uh, if we just have a, a medical kit, and uh, but it's not very effective. So this may be the moment now to give the floor to you in the room. Now, in what we hear about the participation of MSF about the design of new products, and in a more general way uh, about any of the issues we've talked about already this evening. So concerning your first question, it's a, it's a real question. Do we have to keep the messages more general? Is the impact of a message? A general message is more effective than a more detailed uh, message. But I think the example uh, quoted 
by uh, anti-alcohol for uh, pregnant women, I think it has participated in the controversy that went along with it that the vaccines which are uh, not so invasive, we're not sort of talking on the same level of things here. And so well, the French pu public health remains, uh, key, c continues its very general campaigns. Perhaps indeed they haven't really got anything more in detail to be able to spread. But I think that the solution uh, may be through other mechanisms. In Germany, for example, I've understood that there are consultations carried out in the maternity wards of people who come to explain to and talk about the various vaccines and explain to parents. And perhaps consultations which are dedicated to that kind of thing in France might be an option that we could adopt. The physicians uh, are well placed to be able to do it, but I think if in a meeting that lasts just 15 minutes, I don't think it's possible to be able to talk about all those things, about each vaccine, for example. But I think uh, that is an issue which I think the psychology that goes along with it, it is to be able to compare the effectiveness uh, of the mess of general messages uh, risks oversimplification compared to more complex uh, explanations. Uh, perhaps you uh, may be more in favor of, uh, of, 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 you have to try to measure your own level. And so why uh, this vaccine at that price? Uh, there are several things. First of all, it explained in another book, we talk about how do you set the price for vaccines is one of the main questions that have to be asked. And I think that deserves being gone into. It's, uh, but I'd be very interested to know how they set the prices, especially the high prices. You know that the argument that the developmental costs are such uh, that uh, they we have to be we have to we have to get our money back on that. But the work we did on the rotavirus and the costs on that seem much lower. It's about 130 to 100 about uh, about 130 uh, 130 million uh, in development, and those are much higher, in fact, for at the price at which they are selling it now. So I don't really quite understand. But the, 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 the access campaign and the DNDI, uh, we get, when they get into the producing side of uh, pharmaceutical, uh, pharmaceutical companies, uh, they say that the prices, the high prices, are often justified. But then again, on, in other, on other medicines, they are not. But what is true that the price of research and development uh, is a, it can be very costly, costly indeed. And even DNDI says that. And so what we have to do is explain that in real terms. Uh, there was a, a vaccine like uh, hepatitis, a vaccine for hepatitis B. It's one of the reasons that it justifies a higher price for the, uh, the vaccine for hepatitis B. There are justifications behind it. I would like to add something, Ronnie Bowman, on this issue. You alluded to the particular situation of the price which we are ready to pay, uh, and not actually what the product costs itself, but it's the only product in the world. Uh, to, uh, these are the only products in the world uh, where the price is decided upon how it's used. And so often the pharmaceutical industry are the most profitable with the arms manufacturers and with, uh, and with oil uh, companies and banks. And that is done in total opacity, uh, opaqueness, uh, that is beyond uh, all under, uh, logical understanding. And this is an organized thing by, uh, among the pharmaceutical companies. This is something which is arranged between them. But the power of the pharmaceutical lobby is, is incommensurable with other lobbyists. They deploy the greatest armies of lobbyists uh, in the world, in Brussels, and in all the places where decisions are made, uh, where the regulations are decided upon. And they devote an enormous budget uh, to the lobbying. 
and they, 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 they spend an awful lot of money even just in Brussels itself. And this comes back to what you said when you, what you this, this, this comes back to what you talked about, about the HNA, HNA the anti-grip, uh, anti, anti flu uh, in 2009. A, a, a deep running study by the British Medical Journal that were, who uh, employed three journalists full time on this issue about the flu vaccine. And they saw that on all levels, without any exception, the com expert commissions and the decision-making places were infiltrated by by the laboratories and no decision made at that time went against the will of the uh, of uh, of the uh, of the companies and another uh, subject of concern and I'm thinking about an older article that appeared in one of the major medical reviews uh, dating from about one or two years before the other article, an article in which it was, uh, which, uh, an article which is called the Ghost Riders. That, that is the Ghost Riders of the pharmaceutical industry. And this article told uh, uh, about how that the critical clinical trials are, are organized with absolute control by the ph pharmaceutical countries, uh, companies but demonstrated that from the from the inception to the publication of the findings of the of these studies the producer of the drug had a total control over the trial its interpretation its discussion and its application including with the with the scientific uh, societies which uh, write these articles uh, which are given to uh, professors of medicine uh, with 10, 20,000 pages of context, of, of a, and it's absolutely impossible to read by them, by the experts. In other words, Sid, we may consider that a lot of drugs which are put on the market uh, are correct and, and, and justifiable, even, but the consequences we can draw from this, that the laboratories impose their own truth that we have to believe in, and that and concerning me, I no longer uh, have any trust about the new uh, vaccines as soon as the pharmacological aspect of it has been objectively proven. And uh, I, I, you trust the older vaccines than the, uh, the medicines than you do the more, more modern ones, apparently. And so the, with the more recent uh, regulations uh, of the European Union, we have determined that it's the producers who are, are not taking into consideration therapeutic accidents and on the operation on the European level. And so I think here we have a real problem with the all power, all powerfulness of the pharmaceutical industry, which is relatively new. It hasn't always been to this level. Another thing I'd like to add to make the discussion even more confusing, if I may say so, it's the debate of um, uh, truth and transparency. I agree with you completely. I'm not challenging this, but I'd like to shed a different light on this. There is a limit to what can be to what knowledge, uh, to what rational knowledge is. Our human behaviors are certainly not based on constant rationale, particularly when it comes to health. For instance, if you consider the best informed uh, ones, healthcare professionals who do not behave better than others in terms of uh, everyday life and uh, vaccines and drugs uh, versus the rest of the population. Doing what is good for your health is one thing and making statements about it is another story and we will never have a convergence between both. To me, a truth is uh, good for what it's worth. Your book is uh, indeed outstanding because you've avoided all the pitfalls of the uh, uh, preachers of vaccinations and the, the preaching for non-vaccination. And uh, I don't think that we might, however, expect uh, from enlightenment any uh, wonderful outcome 
that all of us may hope for, but that's also what makes uh, life is that we're not uh, we're not uh, uh, prisoners of uh, reasoning. Emmanuel and then Maurice uh, as to uh, the uh, clinical trials and the situations when MSF can play a role, we need to underscore that uh, when it comes to the development on the rotavirus vaccine is that it is an independent trial. It has, uh, and that's not that common when it comes to the development of new products. This uh, trial was uh, run in a completely independent fashion particularly when it comes to collection of data analysis. The manufacturer did not have access at all to the data collected during the trial. Third, uh, second, uh, we've said that even if vaccination was to be imposed, not each and every one is going to enforce it, as that we are all individually taking risks and changes. And we could consider that indeed not being vaccinated is a risk that people will accept uh, for their own life. And I would agree with you that we shouldn't expect that the general population, be it French, uh, Malian, or Senegalese population, will uh, comply will, uh, with all the recommendations and guidelines like uh, uh, good soldiers. Now, I'd like to express a viewpoint which has been reported by the Pierre Murat, the uh, chair of the board of directors of, Epis, of Epicentre, who was also, up until recently, the president of the French Society of Public Health, which is one of the uh, societies in France which was opposed to mandatory uh, vaccination. And the extension of these three vaccines to uh, 11 vaccines and making them mandatory. And one of their arguments was that between convincing and imposing, he would rather be in favor of convincing, and that in France we have not tried everything that was possible on how to try and convince people. It's not that uh, we tried to convince people and it didn't work, but it was not the case. Claire was reporting what happened in New Zealand so that eventually uh, the co coverage rates were very high, even though it was not mandatory. With other aspects of uh, healthcare systems in uh, New Zealand that could also help with that. So, there are other ways uh, that you can think of and you can imagine instead of imposing. Uh, when I uh, started to work on this, I realized that when the first vaccines were introduced, you were talking about uh, smallpox, where the first vaccination campaigns in France, there was uh, this decision to not to make this uh, new prevention tool mandatory as opposed to other countries, uh, saying that convincing based on uh, the evidence and proof uh, was better than obligation. And obligation came long after in France in 1902. So there was a, a, a historical gap in France versus other countries. It's quite surprising to see that in France we're amongst the last countries keeping to, sticking to the obligations while we were one of the last ones to introduce uh, mandatory uh, vaccinations. Uh, Roni, I don't want to monopolize uh, the microphone, but uh, the 2009 H1N1 uh, A flu has uh, certainly played a role, and that's what we read everywhere, has certainly uh, been uh, pivotal in the increased mistrust of the French people uh, when it comes to the official statements made by the uh, health authorities and the uh, pharma companies. And when I read your book, I uh, learned it. I never thought about that. In addition to the fact that uh, the flu vaccine was presented as a collective responsibility and solidarity 
this is what was prescribed uh, in the campaign at that time. But uh, you have uh, pretty much uh, undermined the uh, rigor of these arguments because uh, they wanted to focus on people who were over 60 or 65 years old, let's say old people, for seasonal flu, seasonal flu. You said H1N1. But at that time, it was also the case. H1N1 was for the, the whole population. Well, indeed, my mistake. I'm confusing two things, uh, says Rooney. So it, is, it was shown as a solidarity example, while the least uh, threatened uh, children are, are the children, and they should be vaccinated to eradicate the outbreak. Now, even in a routine statement for seasonal disease uh, that uh, comes up every winter, these arguments can be uh, undermined very easily. This is uh, showing how uh, patronizing uh, the authorities are with the public at large. <laughs> and I'm turning to our national red mayor in terms of public health. Indeed, I have a, a subtitle where I wonder whether uh, vaccination is a macho type of uh, system because my uh, understanding after interviewing several doctors and reading several uh, articles uh, regarding the uh, mumps vaccination, which is a really a benign disease, is that uh, the interest, uh, which is highlighted by the healthcare professionals, is that it's very painful in young males with a likely a uh, decrease of fertility in men, while we consider that it is logical to vaccinate the whole vaccination to reduce the circulation of the virus. And I've realized that for HPV vaccination, which indeed up until today, and even though some papers uh, seem to demonstrate that even young boys could be vaccinated and protected, the main objective is to protect uh, these young girls because uh, this virus may result in uh, cervix cancer. The policy was to vaccinate only women, while if the whole population was vaccinated, we would contribute to the reduction of the circulation of this virus. I was about to talk about it because that's also a disagreement I have with you because those who support HPV vaccination do also support the vaccination of the young men. Professor Bruto uh, is an Italian professor who for the last 20 years has said that, that uh, men should be vaccinated because uh, uh, men also suffer from a certain cancer. That that these are new arguments, but you also have uh, uh, cancer of the anal canal and duct, and also a higher rate of uh, uh, ENT uh, cancers uh, that cannot be attributed to uh, spirits and uh, smoking. So the recommendation is also to vaccinate a young men uh, against HPV. No, it may protect them, but it wasn't done until recently just to reduce the uh, uh, dissemination of the virus between us. Well, we were asked uh, to appreciate it when it came to it came two months. There is a cost to it, nevertheless, and the cost was such that they've decided to protect young girl. My feeling is that uh, physicians and pediatricians uh, are like you. They don't trust parents and uh, that it is useless to try and convince and explain and educate. And I also share your viewpoint that there is a kind of oversimplified uh, discourse which does not necessarily reflect reality. And there is uh, this uh, rejection of parents' questions. I've had uh, the feedback of many parents who've said that uh, they would resist against uh, vaccines because of what the physicians said. Uh, 
when they ask them questions. And this is where the problem lies, because uh, no, not uh, opening a dialogue with the patients is also a source of mistrust. One last question. It's more uh, an observation rather than a question. On the way healthcare is organized and a form of healthcare which promote, which would promote discussion and dialogue and maybe result in vaccination. But in the field, when we work on mass vaccination campaigns or when we are in OPDs, in primary health care uh, centers, uh, we always uh, talked about missed opportunities. And that's one of the big problems uh, with um, medicine in France, where it's all based on uh, individual uh, practice of GPs and not primary uh, health care centers, uh, with the exception of uh, maternal uh, and uh, child protection centers. There are little opportunities to have access to information and uh, access to vaccines. What we have in uh, the countries where we work, when a family comes up and asks for care while they have uh, a vaccination for measles for the young ones and a consultation for the other the older uh, child. And in these centers, we also provide information. We have community health workers explaining to the local population in France when you go for a consultation with your child and that the vaccine is to be prescribed. You have to go to the pharmacy, then you have to go back to the physician, and a new bill is issued by the physician uh, just for the shot. Uh, then there shouldn't be uh, another bill for the second consultation. That's a problem with a. Uh, French, that's a problem for the French social security, the French national health system, because the family has to go back to the doctor several times. While uh, during a consultation, you can convince the person. And if I have uh, the vaccines uh, within reach in a small fridge, uh, they will uh, accept the uh, vaccine. Uh, while in the meantime, in France, they will discuss the, with their neighbor after having had the first consultation. So they won't go to the pharmacy and they won't go back to the second consultation for uh, the uh, vaccination of their child. So maybe the vaccination should be better organized in France. Well, indeed, uh, these were some of the uh, um, this uh, was among the feedback of the uh, consultation with the general population. They had very interesting suggestions to make uh, the uh, pathway simpler for France and to better inform GPs uh, not to improve the knowledge about uh, vaccines, but rather how to talk about how to talk about vaccines. And there were interesting suggestions in this consultation process. Are there any questions? I do have a question, a question which is more particularly directed at those who are negotiating vaccination with the authorities in the MSF programs, both routine vaccination and massive uh, campaigning. No, I'd like to have the viewpoint of uh, some of you about this on this particular topic of what is the uh, response of people when you suggest uh, a vaccination or when you start a campaign. How do they respond? Some experience feedback about consent and a discussion with not with the representatives of people, Mark. For how long have you vaccinated? Oh, I haven't vaccinated for a long time, but I'd like to report an old story in Malawi, where we had a high number of refugees from Mozambique, and there were often outbreaks of measles in the camps, and they were just killing people massively, these outbreaks. And their team was just discouraged to have so many cases of measles and had 
an agreement with the UNHCR for a mandatory vaccination upon arrival of refugees. And it was a simple deal. Either the children were vaccinated and would have uh, access to food and a shelter, or they were not vaccinated, and then families would remain outside the camp and wouldn't have access to anything. That was quite uh, stringent, and that was quite drastic. And we discussed it at length because the primary response was, well, no, you cannot do that. But uh, the uh, team members were so discouraged by the very high number of children dying uh, was making our situation pretty difficult. Now, after having discussed and uh, thought about other arguments, we completely changed the way we proceeded uh, when the uh, refugees arrived at the camp. We've tried, we tried to convince parents that why uh, we were trying to explain why we were vaccinating children and why we said it was important. And ultimately, the result was extremely uh, satisfactory, but it meant additional means and resources. Uh, the simple solution would have seemed to be obligation, but in fact, convincing people with the right argument was probably the best solution, and it was a success. Somebody else, Florence. Uh, talking about campaigns, there are two. Uh, there are two things. There are campaigns. When there are campaigns, when we respond to an outbreak, there is a high number of cases, and that's my experience uh, from a long time ago. That's the time when we provide the best information to people, and uh, we don't go door to door. People show up or they don't show up. And my experiences uh, told me that uh, we didn't force people. We didn't go and force them. And that's the time when people are um, more motivated. They want to protect themselves. And it's, sometimes it's even difficult to deal with a massive inflow of people wanting uh, vaccination. And that's when we are the best. I'm not saying that uh, we are the best one in terms of information, but that's uh, the results are quite good. But then when it comes to routine vaccination, that's my, what I feel uh, with hindsight, that the information is left within the hands of the national authorities, and we say, well, this is done or it wasn't done. And when I went to visit, I realized that we were vaccinating people without uh, telling them what was, we were doing most of the time and that the side effects were not explained. Of course, it's easy. You can blame people in the field, but it's very difficult to set this up. And you have to think it thoroughly. Um, on the other hand, you cannot ask staff in our health structures uh, what to do. They've had a consultation, vaccination of children, etc., etc. They're, they're overwhelmed. Integrating it, it's a nice way to try and educate people, but I think that when it comes to routine vaccination, we're not very good at informing people. And sometimes even I think that we have vaccinated people without telling them what against which disease we were protecting them. So there are things to be improved when we start this kind of activities. Thank you very much. One last comment or a question. Emmanuel, by way of conclusion, I'm going to be very brief. We've highlighted uh, that there was a lack of explanation, and we had some difficulties in understanding all these. Uh, challenges and what was at stake and what could be uh, said is that uh, some uh, policy makers, politicians and uh, uh, physicians haven't done their job properly, but some journalists have done their job properly and Lise has done that and uh, supported by Ronnie and Maurice. So really it means it's a good book. So I really recommend that you read this book. 
No, Christmas is uh, soon, pretty soon, so you can buy a very interesting gift to your relatives. Nothing to be added, says Michael. Thank you very much to all of you for your uh, participation, and you came from uh, various backgrounds, so thank you again. And there will be uh, a few drinks and crisps uh, for you, and you will have also the opportunity to buy the books. And we meet you again next year for the future Foundation Crash Conferences.